right, let's ramp up to our next session, AI for Nature. Now, this panel features some serious firepower, as though we didn't have that already, right, thus far. We've got Andy Dewis, founder of Pineapple Sustainable Partnerships and Pineapple's Chief Strategy Officer, Rafi Adelstone. Then we will be joined by Sasha Dench, CEO and co-founder of Conservation Without Borders and a world record-breaking biologist. And rounding out the panel will be Joe Griffin, Senior Manager of Sustainability Strategy at Vodafone. But before I hand over to them, let me tell you just a little bit about Andy and Rafi. Andy and Rafi, I'm going to embarrass you just a little bit. You'll have to bear with me because your background is phenomenal. Andy has developed Pineapple's impact, growth and partnership strategy with 20 years experience of launching, scaling, buying and selling sustainable businesses. He also advises the boards of multiple sustainability industry bodies and climate tech startups. Rafi leads Pineapple strategy work with 15 years experience supporting big organizations to make those really crucial choices for maximum impact. And previously, he established and led global teams of sustainability advisors and Amazon Web Services and Deloitte. Andy and Rafi, I will hand over to you to further introduce Sasha and Joe and kick off the AI for Nature discussion. The floor is yours. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Shivy. Is Can you hear me? Can some everybody... We can hear you. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, so really excited about this really, really important topic. Um, and um, thank you, Relex, and, and the whole team for, for hosting us. Um, this is uh, brilliant to, to bring this great panel to, um, to everybody. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I will try to kind of uh, compare this, if, if that's the saying, or, um, or, or share this um, and throw a few questions around my amazing panel. Um, I guess the sort of background to this is, you know, we are facing this huge challenge. Uh, since 1970, um, we've lost 70% of our nature globally. Uh, currently, as we sit, I think it's around 1 million animal, animal and plant species are in danger of becoming extinct. And that's uh, about a quarter of all animal and sp plant species globally. So we're in a really dire um, and, um, and challenging situation. Um, and today, what we're going to talk about is what's the role that technology and AI can play in helping us to address some of those challenges. So, Shivi mentioned, um, I'm here today very excitedly with an explorer. I'll let the panel introduce themselves in more detail, but with an explorer um, and conservationist, uh, Sasha. Uh, Joe, who I guess is a, a passionate um, biodiversity um in the blood kind of uh, conservationist but also i think you described yourself as a corporate entrepreneur trying to use the the power of large organizations and, and technology to solve some of these problems uh, and then rafi um who is a, a, a long time technologist um, and sustainability practitioner coming from deloitte's technology and strategy practice and and then Latterly, Amazon, again, um, passionate about sustainability and driving transformation. So, so, so excited to have everybody here. I'm going to ask a few questions and I'll, I'll be quiet mainly now, I think, but we'll, we'll have a bit of a, a discussion around, around what we can do. So in the spirit of, of ladies first, um, could, uh, Sasha, would you mind just sort of introducing yourself, explaining a bit about what you do and just sort of framing um, where you sit within this, this topic? Okay, well, I guess my uh, I'm going to start with giving an outline of kind of before the world of AI, or maybe potentially even in the very early days of AI, before I was even aware of the term, what data collection looked like for um, for me at the beginning of my career. So I was originally a, a shark and turtle biologist. Um, my early career involved things like catching turtles via turtle rodeo, so jumping off the front of a boat, diving into the water catching them in order to grab small skin samples, put tag them to monitor the, the movements of turtles, all of whom were living quite close to the surface, so potentially viewable from the air. Uh, also on anti-poaching uh, patrols, um, and then which involved kind of walking vast beaches, looking for movements of people, counting turtles, which are leaving kind of big, very obvious traces on the sand. Um, and then also uh, involved in the surveys of the shark nets off the coast of, uh, of Sydney. Um, and yeah, that involved 
mostly, obviously, you can't be out there very often. So when you're going out there, you're swimming along the shark nets, identifying things, bringing out dead and dying things, uh, most, of which, most of which, again, are very close to the surface, so potentially viewable from the air in ordinary circumstances. And then aerial surveys involved uh, flying in small planes, um, going out, uh, crossing vast areas of remote Australia. Um, but in order to be able to count the birds with your eyes as a human, in order to on a on a wetland area, we'd have to the pilot would have to do a pretty much deep dive down and fly maybe 30 meters above the surface of the water, because you needed to disturb them in order to disperse the birds at a particular pattern, so you could identify from their wings what species they were, and you do a rapid count recording them into a microphone. And this might all sound uh, quite fun if you're an adventurous, terrifying if you're not an adventurous person, but you can see that they are, there's you know only so much data that you can gather with so many people. They're quite expensive, the kind of flights and things like that. Um, so yeah, the early days of data collection where you know data is critical for making all our decisions, but it has been, um, the opposite of an intelligent, I'd say. It's kind of been quite clunky and slow. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I'd give you my a bit of a background in my into my uh, my early days and what data collection uh, used to look like. Um, and yeah, what I now do is I, I run a conservation charity called Conservation Without Borders. We do expeditions with uh, migratory species. And quite often what we're looking for are, um, what, go on an expedition, we look for the threats, but quite often there are local people with solutions. So we identify either people uh, that have got some solutions or systems change. And in those solutions that we come across from people, some of those are very much human. For example, what is driving the trade in endangered species that is uh, driving a certain animal to be to be caught. But others are, you know, could be really solved by um, technical issues, for example. How do we know where illegal wells are uh, popping up, particularly when they pop up rapidly and in vast numbers and can drain an entire wetland? So yeah, we look at, at all of those. Um, so yeah, my interest in, uh, in AI has, I guess, come from very early on in my career when, in fact, in the days of genetic sampling, I was um, offered a PhD, which was well, several PhDs, all of which were incredible. But at the same time, I was working in a, a, a PR agency uh, looking at the latest technology. And I could see then that the data that was going to take me three years to process, I would collect, process and, uh, and analyze and do something with would take me at least three years. And within a few years, I knew that you could do that in three weeks or maybe three days. So this, uh, this desire to be able to have get knowledge fast and the, the idea of just how far we could take it um, has been a passion of mine from, yeah, a good 30 years ago. Very good. And you forgot to mention, I always, I always mention that you, you're a free diving champion as well, which I always think is pretty cool um, when it comes to, uh, to, 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 to diving down and looking at sharks. Not if that's not cool enough. Well, um, then, uh, partly catching turtles in Turtle Rodeo was where I learned that I'd actually be quite good at that. So, uh, Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holding your breath. Amazing. Cool. I think we'll, we're, that's great background. I think maybe we'll pick on, um, we can't do ladies first, so if we pick on Joe, um, would you mind giving us a bit of your um, background, sort of passion for this area and, um, uh, and where you sit within the world? Yeah, of course. Um, thanks, Andy. Um, so yeah, I'm Joe Griffin. Hi, everyone. Um, and I work in the Vodafone sustainability team um, in London. I think my my kind of career started in in sort of school and being a, a bird watcher from a very young age um my my kind of data was was gathered through my eyes and my ears and transferred to a notebook um and and sort of i i remember when i sort of followed my education through sort of into biology and environmental biology and um my sort of first job after college was as an ecologist on a small uh, wildlife reserve in, in the UK, where again, I was sort of catching small mammals and, and weighing them and noting this down with a pencil and, and then putting it all into a spreadsheet and similarly, you know, analysing the effect of climate change on falcons in the Isle of Mull in Scotland, I would be relying on other people's data that would be sort of transferred onto onto spreadsheets. Um, I. You know, I learned how to uh, distinguish birds by their bird call um, 
uh, something that I've, I've always pride myself on. Um, and now my friends can do that equally well using an app. So um, I, I've seen how sort of technology has has come into my uh, into my world. And um, a few about ten years ago, I, I started working um, for Vodafone, and I, I very quickly uh, became aware of the, the potential of technology, not in the ecological sense. That's that's come quite a lot later, but more in the uh, in the sense of um, economic uh, development. So. Um, in East Africa, Vodafone um, uh, developed a product 15 years ago called M-Pesa, which was a very simple way of transferring funds from an individual to an individual or a merchant through an SMS. Um, and I fell in love with this platform because it's so simple and so transformative. And, and that's really where my passion for technology comes in. Um, I'm, not, I'm not an engineer. Uh, I only understand so much about technology, but but with M-Pesa, that idea of, of SMS is transforming so many millions of people's lives and families' lives and economies is is just super impressive. And if you want to understand more about M-Pesa, have a look on Google. Rafi's, you know, Rafi knows a lot about it, having having worked with me on understanding some of the impacts. Um, and I think. Then sort of fast forward to now and the and the sort of disaster that we're facing in terms of nature that, that Andy outlined. I mean, I look out of my office. I, I'm I, I'm a constant bird watcher. I don't I can't stop bird watching in the sort of peripheral vision. The skies are quiet, and and they weren't when I was a boy, um, and they were even noisier when my dad was a boy. Um, and so I'm really kind of so enthused by what happened with Impesa. And, and transforming economies and people's um, livelihoods. How can we do the same for nature? Um, and so at Vodafone, um, we work on a few sort of nascent projects that, that really kind of look to, to solve this. And I'm, I'm happy to sort of talk more in depth about those as the conversation develops. Oh, it's a cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. Well, I can talk about it if you want. But... We're, left as, we're left as waiting for more. No, we'll, we'll go around. We'll go around the screen. Um, so, so yeah, over to you, Rafi. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everybody. So, um, so I'm Rafi. I, I lead strategy for Pineapple Partnerships, um, and I I've came to Pineapple um, because after a year, after many years working at Deloitte and Amazon for big corporations, I work with Joe and others at Vodafone, where I became frustrated that you know, each individual company is really thinking about sustainability or nature, and in this this case, with focusing on nature as a problem that they that only sits within their own boundaries or that is a problem with their own um, impact reports or for their own customers. And by definition, these challenges are not not solvable by individual companies. They're only solvable by system change um, and by collaboration. And that's what we aim to do at Pineapple Partnerships is bring big scale partners together to do things across the value chain. Uh, and what are the enablers of that change? There are only a few of like, you know, system enablers, there's money and how we drive finance into these challenges, which we do we focus on. There's leadership and culture, which is sessions like this hope to hope to impact. You know, we want to sort of spread the gospel of deployment of tech, of, of, of making an impact in these areas. But a really big driver, big enabler of change is technology. And that's that's why I went to, to Amazon, to AWS, to try and figure out how you can really de deploy data at scale and figure out ways of connecting the dots across value chains found it very difficult at AWS very happy to go into some of that uh, uh, and AWS has a fo focus on nature a big partnership with um, Natural History Museum all around measuring biodiversity um, which really interesting we could talk about but um, uh, what, what I really sort of le le learned from that experience and from my experience working with Joe and others is it's all about proving what works um, finding these examples it's an emerging space it's really challenging to really even illustrate what the potential is for AI and other forms of technology to, to make a difference in, in nature and other spaces. So how can we elevate and uh, you know demonstrate these these solutions? And that's why we've got Sasha and Joe here today. We're going to talk about some of the things they're doing. Amazing. Yeah, and I think that kind of hits the nail on the head a little bit. It's, it's the, you know, we're in this stage of discovery, aren't we? And we are dealing with very complex systems that we clearly don't fully understand because we're destroying them. Um, and, you know, how can 
um, technology help us to better understand those those systems and um, um, uh, and then take action. And so I, I think I'm, I'm going to be boring and keep going around in the, in the circle, if that's OK. And, and I'll, I'll come back to you, Sasha, because I don't and I'm going to leave on what, what you said. So 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 we're in this world, of, the, the analog world, we'll call it. Um, well, we're diving, grabbing turtles and writing down um, things on pieces of paper. Um, and then I, I guess one of your experiences in, in more recent times, um, I really think maybe we set this that, talk about kind of where we are now, um, and then we'll, we'll maybe go around a bit and talk about where we think that we can go in the future. So so where do you think we are now versus that kind of analog world and... and um, uh, mm. Uh, and what are the, the kind of breakthroughs that you've you've seen? Um, mm. but I, I still know I still do the Royal Society of Protection for Birds. I walk around and 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 uh, and, and count and record things. And I still know that you know, I was speaking to a lady at, at one of your events a couple of weeks ago, who sits in an estuary and does the same thing. So I think there's still a long way to go. But I'd love to see how how far we've come and and. Um, on, on what, what you sort of see. Well, that's, I mean, that's excellent. In, just in terms of uh, AI is actually opening up lots of opportunities for more citizen science. And whilst you might be thinking, okay, that's very, that's very basic. It's getting members of the public. You don't really know what they're looking for, getting out and learning about them. But actually if AI enables us to take people's data and actually you sense check it quite quickly, then that is, that is incredible. It gives us a lot more eyes and ears on the ground. Um, yes, yeah, so don't uh, don't don't poo poo that effort. Um, and those are those are efforts have been yeah absolutely incredible. Um, I guess where are we now? I mean, there's there's lots of different ways I could, that I could go into, like different ways of identification of species that can happen much faster. We can do that through biophones underwater. We're now kind of doing that in different projects, deploying biophones in remote areas um, that can record. Uh, all the different species because there's tech which can identify the different animal calls and it now also that enables, enables us all to also work at night um, where traditional cameras and eyes don't work so well. Um, so there is there are lots of different ways of using data, c collecting it uh, remotely and you know that technology is getting cheaper and cheaper for gathering data. Um, can I, am I allowed to give a word of caution though that comes also from my background? It's probably before kind of technology, what the use of AI started to even kick off in terms of, um, in terms of conservation. Um, and that is in the, so I grew up in a fishing town in Australia and um, uh, in our fishing town, um, all of the young men that I knew were either in the logging industry or they were in the fishing industry. And as I was going through university, a lot of them were taking over the fishing industry from their parents. And um, they were basically, they were fishing as hard as they could. Fish numbers were disappearing. And rather than everybody going at that time, oh, gosh, we need to... Um, uh, we need to think about sustainability of these fish populations at the time. Tech was appearing and appearing and being available cheaper and cheaper. And what that actually enabled us to do, rather than be cleverer about how we manage the fish populations, fish supply, it actually enabled us to be clever about uh, because it basically the radars and enable us not only people to be able to find fish, to be able to fish deeper, to be able to fish more efficiently, so faster. Um, so it actually hugely empowered our ability to take everything. And we pretty much did. And uh, there wasn't the systems in place to ensure that there had to be a long term thinking. And so I grew up in a generation of young men who all thought, OK, for 10 years, we're going to have a fishing industry. So we're going to make sure we have a second career. Um, and so uh, can I just throw in that word of caution that this AI at that point, my first introduction was actually like quite shocking. It enabled us to to do amazing things. But it's a human choice whether we use it for a good or we use it for um, for um, for extracting more and faster. Um, so, yeah, let me let me throw that in there and uh, pass over to Joe. Yeah. Yeah, um, thanks, Sasha. I think that was a really, um, really interesting point that you use. I mean, we're still, you know, uh, ultimately AI is, is a sophisticated, can be a sophisticated tool, um, but it's it's how you then use it and use the information that you get. Um, we're, we're working on a project at the moment called M Twiga, um, and it's a a three hundred and sixty degree camera that's that's housed on on top of a pole, and it's um, 
it's designed to as an early warning system for, for predators encroaching into communities in East Africa. Um, and the idea is that, that once identified using um, uh, AI, we can send a, an SMS alert to the community and also um, uh, a deterrent out towards the, the predator to, to um, avert them from you know, causing or coming into contact with humans. A remote, a remote deterrent a noise or a sound or it, a... It, exactly so you know using the understanding that for example um uh elephants don't like the sound of african bees and and there's a lot of bee fences and so on to use um similarly with with uh, irregular strobe lights can can deter big cats um and and in the time it takes to sort of send an sms to the uh, kenyan wildlife service or or to the w or to the park rangers um can be enough to hopefully, um, uh, you know, stop the human wildlife conflict. Um, and, and, and that can pick up a predator that doesn't necessarily isn't isn't tagged, has isn't giving off a signal. That's that's identifying a wild animal by its form, movement, face pattern, or something. Okay, yeah, it, it, exactly. And and so we've been sort of testing uh, testing this in the UK, and we we went out to Kenya actually a few weeks ago. And, and took two of our prototype units out to test them. And um, one thing, we, I'll come back to your point around human choice, because I think we've, we, as we develop this product, there's a, there's a very clear kind of human choice element that, that we're, we have to tackle uh, around, you know, use of, use of the information. Um, but, but primarily, what's, what's an interesting thing from an AI and technology point of view is, uh, we use some some uh, off-the-shelf sort of data sets for uh, object identification and, and predator identification. Um, but because MTwiga, the solution, is looking quite far out, most of the data sets come from information from camera traps, mm -hmm. which are a lot lower down. Um, so when we tested, we were getting quite a lot of anomalies. For example, um, we tested at Longleat Safari Park in the UK, and, and we set the camera up in the hyena den. And we were really perplexed because it was coming back with lots of um, sightings of baboons. <laughs> and, um, and I mean, this speaks to the, one of the sort of challenges I've noticed, which is like the, the lack of, of data sets. Um, and if you, look at a, if you look at a picture of a hyena from three meters high, it kind of looks a bit like a baboon. And so it's quite, it's really quite, it was quite an interesting revelation. So we thought, okay, well, when we go to Kenya, we'll, we'll test the AI that we've got, but actually what we're there primarily to do is gather data. So we spent um, uh, 10 days capturing um, images of the form of the species of interest in all sorts of different lights, um, in different habitats, coming and going, you know, moving around so that we can build a, a bespoke um, object detection model mm -hmm. that's actually going to call a hyena a hyena um, and not a baboon. So I think that shows that, like, whilst it's very exciting, yeah. you know, we're at the early, we're very much at the early stages with a lot of it. But that is that is great, though, that we can uh, we can be applying. That's that, that's where human intelligence is necessary. That's what humans do really well is that behind the scenes work. That's un kind of understanding the different forms of things, um, mm. and then being able to program it. But it's great that we can we are now, if we're at the point where we can be putting time into that, and then knowing that once that has been done, then the AI will be able to give us all the amounts of data which would in the past have involved lots of undergraduate students sitting in remote areas like pressing buttons or you know ticking boxes they certainly need to go out in the field still but the um the amount of data we can get in basically being able to uh, free humans from uh having to do the um you know very basic repetitive stuff that a machine can do uh and go for the more intelligent thing is is huge progress if we use it well yeah, t totally agree. And I think we've seen over the last few years how satellite imagery and satellite data has added so much to our understanding of what's happening um, around the planet. Uh, but but increasingly, I think we're, we're, we're discovering that you need to really partner with some ground truthing, yeah. and whether that be a kind of ecologists on the ground, conservationists on the ground, or increasingly sensors that are on the ground. So, you know, you can you can get that sort of scale with technology that perhaps it, we struggle with as individuals. Mm -hmm. two, two questions for me, Joe. First of all, can you just share a bit about the sort of context of why this is needed? Like what is the problem that we're trying to solve in terms of animal um, 
human interaction mm -hmm. and then also from a nature perspective like how do you think about the sort of you know the proliferation of iot of sensors and the interaction it has in nature like obviously two very different questions yeah okay yeah. so I'll, I'll start with um human wildlife conflict so uh, this is well i, I I'll first of all, kind of really talk about where this came from. So this idea was the idea of a grad in Vodafone, okay, um, called Amy Turner, and who may well be on, on the, the call today. Um, Amy is a conservationist and um, travels a lot in East Africa, and, and she saw on one of her trips firsthand the, the impacts of human wildlife conflict. So what it basically is, is increasingly, um, human communities and protected areas are, um, are, are becoming closer, okay? And as we see increasing habitat loss and effects of climate change, um, species that, that exist within these protected areas are living in habitats that are in, under increasing strain. And therefore they are increasingly encroaching into those communities where livestock is present. You know, livestock is the basis for the economy in a lot of these, um, in a lot of the areas of, of rural East Africa. Um, and that's where the conflict happens. So if you have, um, so wildlife, uh, uh, a livestock boma is a small kind of circular um, pen, which is often um, ha has sort of brush and, and bushes as the sort of fence. And that's where you keep your livestock um, at night in particular. And, and increasingly in areas we're getting uh lions leopards hyenas coming in to basically get a get a get a meal and what you'll find is that these animals won't necessarily take just take take a, a one cow they'll actually kill a lot of the cows that are in that that boma um and that has de devastating effects on on the family on the individual because that's their livelihood that's their that's their annual income um so there's that aspect, the economic aspect. Then there's the aspect that if the farmer or the family or the community become aware that there's a predator in the boma, then they will try and deter that predator, which leads to uh, it leads to death on part of the community, so humans, um, and on the part of the wildlife as well. And, and wildlife has a has a value um, for economies which is sort of has been calculated is known. So it's it's like, you know, you're losing again and again and again in all these different types of scenarios. Same with elephants and encroaching on, into arable um, lands uh, to, 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 to eat um, corn and so on. So that's the problem. The problem is not just in East Africa, it's everywhere. So I've got a colleague who's coming over from Romania, uh, from Vodafone Romania on, on Thursday. She wants to talk to me about bears and the issue that, that we have with bears. Um, Ursula von der Leyen, who's the, the former president of the, the European Commission, I think, um, she had her, her family pet pony killed by a wolf in, in Germany. If you go to northern, northern um, United States, same issue again. Um, so this is, a, this is kind of a global issue, but it's kind of not, not really seen. And it's a huge threat to some of the most emblematic species that, that we know, as well as being a huge threat to the the livelihood and safety of communities. Um, can, I, can I add a bit of a, sorry. If, yes, please. Yeah, can I add a bit of a, a knock on from that? So the situation you were speaking about in West Africa, so the alternative to identifying the animal is there, is that people will by default want to get rid of those predators and that quite often happens through poisoning. Yeah. Um, and for what we work on, the poisoning of one, one large cat, for example, um, could then involve, like you kill a large cat in uh, parts of East Africa and you attract uh, all the vultures in the area. And so there are examples of where, you know, tens and even hundreds of vultures have been killed from one, uh, the killing of one uh, animal because every vulture that eats it will be poisoned um, and get rid of vultures in a community. And that quite often is what is keeping communities healthy. They're eating the um, decaying carcasses of other things. So the knock on effect from that one protecting the, that one animal um, could be much bigger than, uh, than anybody thinks and bigger than that direct community. It can go on onto surrounding communities as well. Yeah, I think, I think you raise a really good point and there's surprising given that, the, the gravity and the, the scale of, of this problem is surprisingly little written and researched about it, but some of these indirect um, effects mm. are, 
you know, truly um, uh, devastating for, for ecosystem health and, as you say, for, for community health. Yeah. I think you had a second half of your question. I'm not sure if you've covered it yet. <laughs> uh, no, that's, uh, I think, to paraphrase it, is it about um, the issue with leaving sensors all around all around all these, these sort of pristine habitats? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I, I think, again, that's a challenge for, for us, for example, with the deployment of Entwiga. It's like understanding, well, look, how, what's the model? I mean, we're still developing the technology, right? So we're not, we're not at, at the sort of stage of, of really deploying it at scale. It's still prototype. But um, what's our, what's the model for its actual use? Do, you know, is it, um, how do we, how do we maintain it? And how do we make sure at, at the end of life? It's it's not just left in the environment. Um, oh, it's just reminded me that last week one of our prototypes got knocked over by a buffalo, um, but we have <laughs> we picked that up now. Um, uh, I think that's a, I think that's going to be I think that's going to be a challenge, particularly as costs of some sensors really comes down. Like some acoustic sensors you can get off Amazon or whatever, it's it's starting to to, to come right down. Um, uh, I mean, y yeah. It, I, I don't really know. I mean, I mean, e-waste proliferates. E-waste is a huge issue for the environment. Um, we we struggle to collect redundant mobile phones from people's drawers. Uh, so I think you raise a really good challenge for for the community as how do we ensure that as we invest more in nature tech and, and it proliferates more and we see the value in it, we're also addressing how do we ensure this doesn't just end up as as junk in the environment? Mm -hmm. um, and and you know maybe if uh, if we thought about um, some other technologies uh, that we have, um, and we thought about the the sort of end of life a bit earlier on in 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 the kind of development, we would have come up with more intelligent solutions than we have now. Mm. Again, it's that long term thinking. I mean the the ability to I mean you you highlight that as an issue of waste but just imagine if we were monitoring kind of the yeah from the from the air which is what we've often got from our migratory following migratory birds certainly the aerial view gives you um a very direct uh you can't obviously notice sensors if they're tiny but that compared to certainly across west africa which we traveled recently there are times of year when the rivers are look like a river of plastic it is a river of waste from the air, you can see the kind of inputs as well. You can identify pretty much where the pollution inputs are coming from. So yeah, waste is a waste is a pretty massive issue everywhere, and live monitoring um, is a is an incredibly powerful tool at figuring out where that's where that is and uh, and trying to deal with it. Um, can I can I give another example, which is it's kind of related to to Joe's in terms of identif identification and being able to notify people, and that is around the energy. Uh, industry is that is that right Rafi have you did you get your answer yeah so um uh for the I guess the key the key areas Andy you asked me earlier about breakthrough solutions and I'd say a kind of breakthrough in that I want to cover two issues one of those is um energy infrastructure because we are we all use energy personally and in our companies and increasingly we're wanting that all to be renewable energy which is fantastic and we're seeking it from further afield so there is there are plans to um, you know, for a big renewable energy plant in Morocco that's coming direct to the UK, for example. And in terms of the impact on birds, I'm not sure whether many people really understand quite how um, how big an impact that is. So on our last expedition, we followed the migration of the ospreys from Scotland down into West Africa. One of our three juvenile birds was killed on a um, by electrocution. Um, but then as we got into Spain, they had tagged 11 juvenile birds there and eight of them on their first migration before they crossed over, leaving Spain into Morocco. Eight of them had already died uh, by being electrocuted onto, on, uh, on power lines. Um, and as you, as you head towards the southern coast of Spain, if any of you have been to Tarifa and places like that, you can see that there's big turbines all along that south coast. I think there's 800 of them all set up. And, you know, it is brilliant. We need more renewable energy. There's, there's, um, there's you know, no denying that. 
Um, but the potential, when those were first built, the impact on uh, migratory birds of all kinds was huge. And you might think, okay, that's, that's one area. Um, however, when you look at the migration of birds, certainly that southern bit of Tarifa is a bottleneck. So all the birds, many of them that are coming from across Europe are being channeled there because that's the narrow point across uh, into southern Africa. So should we be really worrying about a few migratory birds? I mean, we're talking about hundreds at a time. And so the technology solution that has been deployed there um, has in order to be able to keep those turbines running and have it acceptable um, is they've got ecologists stationed at the bottom of lots of those turbines so that an ecologist at any point can see all of the turbines and they have an on off button and they wait they identify the species that are coming coming near and they've got a they've got a, a ratio of um, birds which are um, you know I uh, highly endangered, it's a it's a hard stop, so the turbines will stop immediately, uh, less highly endangered. The cleverness about humans at the moment is that humans have also learned, actually some birds will avoid the turbines. They will just go over them and around them. Others, for some reason, will not, um, will go into them. So there is all sorts of technology being built that not only identifies birds that are coming, will also you know, remove the distant helicopter from the equation. Um, but, you know, that is obviously critical for our energy infrastructure. Um, it's also critical around airports. Uh, so the, I think IATA have reported that actually collisions with, um, collisions with birds are increasing uh, and uh, to the point of being, I think, 1.2 to 1.4 million US dollars it costs a year in uh, impacts with uh, migratory birds. So all that kind of work is, is incredible. Uh, that, that's, uh, application for AI is amazing. We haven't simply haven't got enough um, ecologists to be stationed at the bottom of um, of wind turbines in order to be able to remove that kind of um, collision. Um, but the thing that a lot of people probably wouldn't realise about electrocution electrocution of birds is that about 15% of all the wildfires started in Australia and in the US come from the electrocution of a bird that is kind of burning and falls and sets fire to the forest around it. So the, the impact then on AI is a bit like the, the, the um, explanation we gave with you before, Joe. It's, uh, it's, it probably takes a human to understand that, that system behind it, that looking after birds is also looking after that whole habitat, is looking after people, and it should be part of our response to, to climate change. So the potential is amazing. It's always expensive for the first people that invest in it and the first people that decide to take it on until it becomes legislation. But um, yeah, also as somebody who lost their house to a bushfire in Australia, who knows, maybe ours also started from uh, from electrocution of a bird, but the, the potential there is, um, yeah, amazing. I think I, it sort of raises a question. I, th I think um, I'm curious from, from everybody really around, around the power of technology to A, better understand the system because I think a lot of what we talked about here is, you know, we do one thing trying to be good, you know, and one of my big passions, I was at Schneider Electric for many years and, and I grew up in Africa and one of one of the businesses that we have is around access to energy, um, trying to bring clean energy um, to places that, that don't have it. Um, and just sort of listening to, to, your, um, to your explanation there, Sasha, you know, a, a lot of these things, incredibly interconnected, incredibly complex. And then a lot of the work that I guess we, we try to do at Pineapple is then bring multiple organizations together. So, you know, can a Schneider's renewable energy system power Joe's um, IoT technology uh, in a clean energy uh, sort of way um, with a with a with this sort of paradigm around we're, we're gonna deliver some, <laughs> some positive outcome here. Um, and then we just don't understand or see that complexity. I know Sasha, a lot of the work that you do is sort of on the ground conservationist work, trying to understand how these things link together, trying to understand you know, what, what are those different lessons. Sounds like Joe from you know what you were talking about. I, I loved the um the the uh the, the baboon safari park example, you know, it just shows how kind of um how far we've got to go in some ways with with some of this, um, even even with a sort of not straightforward application, I wouldn't say, but you know, a, 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 um, a fairly sort of point point application of the technology. When you then start to sort of look at 
how all of these things aggregate together. And I think, you know, for the vulture example, there's also um, cases I've heard about with, uh, you know, cattle just sort of links back to, 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 to your, um, to your point, um, Joe, on, on people's livelihoods, but cattle being given medication to sort of keep them alive, which then poisons vultures or poison, you know, whatever. So, um, so I guess we've got this sort of challenge of we, 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 we're trying to do good <laughs> with these things. Inherently, there'll be these kind of unintended consequences. We believe, uh, from a pineapple perspective, there's a great opportunity for organisations to, to get themselves together, to learn from nature, to learn from these things and to apply technology to, to try to do that. I don't know what your kind of perspectives are on you know, how we tackle that and, and the best way to go about tackling that, because we'll make missteps and we'll make mistakes uh, as we go along the way, but but what are your perspectives on on that side of things? And Rafi as well, chime in from from your side. I mean, I'm 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 happy to sort of kick off there. I think um, so. A couple of things spring to mind on on our journey with um, Mtwiga. The first thing, so when Amy got in touch with me and said, "Look, I've got this idea," um, uh, tried to sort of went to get some some seed funding. Um, the first thing we did was uh, connect with Safaricom, which is our um, operating company in, in Kenya, and with WWF, who are a partner in Vodafone's on in a different sort of area. Um, just realizing that 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 we need we we have part of we have part of an idea, um, but it requires all communities and constituents to really build the whole um, and. Amy, as I said, was was very familiar with East Africa. She she'd been there many times. She'd experienced it. She was very um, knowledgeable about wildlife, but still to be able to have, you know, our colleagues on the ground who can tell us, you know, that's not going to work. This is going to work. Did you know this? And and same, same with WWF. And I think we need to approach all of this with nobody's got the one solution. It's all about. I, I don't like to be the guy on the panel to say it's all about partnership because everybody says that. It's really easy to say, but it's about. It's about getting it's about connecting right early so if you think you can do something talk to the people who are being affected and and understand more um and i think the other thing just to say about how how you how you solve a system i mean again that's a that's a session in itself right but you mentioned about sort of energy and that that sort of made me think that actually we're still in the situation where we're talking about technology in a world where uh, 2.6 billion people or a third of the world are not connected to the internet. And I find that really, you know, really fascinating that when we went out to um, Kenya, to, to Mara Siena to test our solution, Kenya has a very high level of internet connectivity and coverage. Um, but you're talking about these rural settings and you're putting in place really cutting edge um, technology in places that are still using basic two, three G phones, and and um, so I find that really a really kind of interesting juxtaposition. And um, so there's a whole load of humanitarian economic development that needs to take place in the same time and align to this sort of ecological technological development that we're all talking about. None, none of them are isolated. And the way I think about, it, and that's really, really insightful. Thank you, Joe. The way that I think the framework I would use to think about these challenges is about how can we maximize positive impacts and minimize negative impacts, right? And I think AI and technology gives us the opportunity to, 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 to do both. Um, maximizing positive impacts means, as you said, Andy, taking a system wide view. What is the value chain that we're worried about? What, how do we understand, uh, map it through using data? How do we uh, find that isolate hotspots, use big data and analytical tools to be able to prioritize where action is needed? And all that kind of stuff is in, is in our gift, and we can do that today as, as technology sort of rolls out. And t t t noting to Joe's point about it not being ubiquitous yet. On the other side of the, the equation, how do we minimize negative impacts, both in terms of you know the the actions that we're taking, but uh, or that we're trying to solve for, but also the actions that we take. Whether that is we mentioned e-waste, whether that's around, you know, the use of technology itself. Like, you know, we we have to recognise that, you know, the growth of AI it comes with with a, sustain, a sustainability challenge alongside that. Um, you know, the 
the um, the renewable en energy that's required to power data centers, and actually, more importantly, in some ways, the materials required to to build and service those those data centers, particularly chips that are you know very energy intensive to make. You know, all that stuff is part of the challenge that we need to consider when we think about AI and whether that's in whatever domain. So, so I think you know needs to, needs to be considered in in, in the round. Um, but the opportunity is huge. Like you know, nature as a domain as a, as a topic is is something that's risen up the corporate agenda really fast like three years ago maybe four years ago nobody was talking really co corporate level about nature and the same way they're talking about climate now they started to become impact parity of, of of interest and that's really a massive opportunity uh, for you know for for companies like the vodafone and, and for you know organizations like sasha just to to really uh to 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 grasp to grasp to grasp that 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 attention and I think there's a, for me in particular, the this idea that there's still a connection between, I think one of you, was it you, Rafi, maybe that said that the focus is still quite on stuff which is, feels like it's within your boundaries. So we mentioned the example of energy infrastructure. It is difficult for a company to, to look at the issue of energy infrastructure and go, yes, we want to be a part of it because we're a tiny part, everyone, something everyone's using. So encouraging um, the kind of corporate world to think big is one of the things we're looking at at the moment. I said think big to, to help us look at those really big systemic issues. We have a project called MI5 for Nature looking at that. But I guess another important thing I think is to look at, make sure when you're looking at the, the data, what we're reading from it is always pulling apart where is the human system that the data that AI is not going to understand no matter how hard we look at it. So taking vultures as a simple example, AI is not going to figure out how do you how do you stop people from wanting to trade in vulture parts because there's a belief that they you know give you foresight and leadership and everything else. I can't imagine any algorithm that will be able to do that without humans thinking of that. Um, and similarly, um, if fair enough, they can get I could imagine lots of ways it can gather data on where um, you know uh, high risk lines you can map bird migrations against uh, against uh, all the planned and future uh, lots of energy infrastructure all that sort of thing could be done we've got uh, drones at the moment that can survey along power lines and look at uh, things that would make good perches for birds we can look at where bird poo is appearing and things so there would be a ways of identifying actually where are that that kind of uh, animal data can be uh, can be looked at, but then going behind the that and looking at the bigger system and that kind of looking at why are why is the infrastructure that's not sort of fit for purpose still being built? That's again a complex human system that we really need to have um, to have human human brains and uh, enthusiasm into. And I guess a big thing for us is. Um, a big thing of even behind the title conservation without borders is that i have felt that conservation for, for too long has been in the hands of um of conservationists and ecologists and i'm putting my hand up as being one of them we have all been taught from a particular point of view we've all been taught that solutions involve getting more data and once you have data people will be convinced but actually we have we don't have the same understanding of the system as vodafone might or as any of the big energy infra infrastructure companies have and so i've had really interesting um conversations with just engineers who go kind of what who've come up with very different solutions to the ones that ecologists and scientists would come up with for how do we solve the energy infrastructure issue because conservationists don't understand the system so my um i, I just think for, for me the whole future the next 10 years ai is one thing but let's have also use all the data to get more um more people from within industry with a different understanding of the world uh, involved in the in the systems change mm. yeah Again, back to that human and and uh, technology interactions. Incredible. Yeah, it, it frees us all to have better collaboration. So I'm going to say it for you, Joe. Partnerships is good, but we really do need those. Yeah, amazing. I, well, we've only got three minutes left. So what I'm probably going to do, I'm an optimist, and there's a lot in it. Sometimes people, bit, you know, we're, we're talking about an absolute disaster and crisis uh, with what's going on. In the in, in in the world, when we with, with respect to this topic, um, can I as can we just sort of go around and, and and fill the end of this session with a little bit of hope? So, so what what do you kind of see, Joe? I'm going to pick on you, but Joe, what's your sort of vision for the future and the role that technology can do, and and sort of helping to um, to avert the nature crisis and you know, that make that little boy that was uh, uh, walking around with his notepad um, full of hope. So I, I think I will go back to that in a way. And what I said at the start, what gives me hope is the um, 
it is how technology can make nature accessible. And if you can make nature accessible, people start to understand it. And if they understand it, then hopefully they'll value it. And and I mentioned, you know, I spent many years trying to understand the difference between a willow warbler and a wood warbler by their sound. Um, and now there's an app that does it. My friends used to say, I've seen a bird, what is it? And describe it. They don't anymore, they have the app. And But what's happening is they've all become bird watchers which is great. So um, whilst I feel slightly less needed um, and my ego is, is not quite as, um, uh, you know, uh, massaged every time I tell them what a bird is, they're engaged. And that's great because they will see that there aren't any swifts in the air and they might do something about it. So I think get people involved through technology. Amazing. Rafi. Um. I think the most powerful message from today really is, uh, you know, I know a lot about what Joe's been doing um, with Mtwiga, but I didn't realize it's still it's so, still so much further to go when it comes to scaling and maturing as an idea. And I think that's a real emblematic story for where we are. You know, we're a, we're in a world in which AI and technology is starting to creep up the the innovation curve. Um, we're not reached scale and maturity, um, and that gives us great hope because we don't really know what, what the future holds when it comes to the deployment of these tools. So I think we have lots to be optimistic about. I would say uh, similar that the this access to data, uh, or A, it's the fact that it will free up scientists and, uh, and conservationists to really start focusing on the systems change rather than just being out and, and gathering the data, although the education system needs to rapidly change to uh, accommodate that as well. I don't feel like it's still there. Um, so there's there's potential there. Let's say that, Andy. But I also feel the same for any companies wanting to monitor like their impacts. Like there is nothing really. To, well, there will be certainly nothing really to stop you looking at, you know, on the ground. What does it What does it look like in the places where our raw materials are coming from? How is that changing? Um, you know, potentially, you know, week by week, month by month. That will all become very uh, very obvious. But can I also say that I'd hope that. I think if anyone who's got a shifting baseline example, like Joe mentioned his with birds in the sky used to being used once upon a time full of birds. Um, I have examples from uh, my the first time I went out spearfishing thinking my dad would be really proud of me and he was horrified because this sea off Sydney was used to be a very, very different thing. What I thought was already healthy, he remembers it when there were you know vast numbers more fish than before. So I guess my hope is that we look at, um, now that we're going to be gathering so much more data, we look at that um, as a tool for getting, potentially aiming to get back to where we would have been when our ecosystems were more healthy, rather than taking this vast amount of data as being our new baseline, because uh, this is not what we want to aim for. We want to aim for, um, yeah, that sky that used to be once full of birds and the sea that once used to be teeming with fish. Amazing. Well, I think I think we're about at time. I think we will be transitioning back to Shivy in a in a moment. Um, all I would like to say is a massive thank you. It's always great hanging out with you guys. You fill me with so much hope because of the amount of good work uh, and effort that you're going to 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 try to advance this and kind of echo the points. There's we're so early in this journey. We've done quite a bit of damage <laughs> but we've got so much potential to um to to change that and, and technology isn't the solution but it's got to be part of of that solution given the the, the huge mountain that we uh, that, that we're looking to climb so thank you so so much and i think we're transitioning back we are indeed. Thank you, Andy, Rafi, Joe, and Sasha for that great energy, commitment, and concrete ideas there. I especially like that idea of if you want to do something, talk to the people already driving change in that space, you know, create more momentum. I think that's a great concept. Also, there's a lot there about enablers of change, bringing partners on to ramp up initiatives across the value chain with a focus on nature, of course. And as you say, finding those successful examples, proving what works and elevating those solutions in technology to take action. As you say, it's one part of the puzzle. 